Um, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you very much for the invite to come here and, and talk to you today. Um, I've actually picked up on a few points that of, that's come on already in terms of, um, you know, somebody saying we, we, you know, Australia, huge, huge empty space, and yet we live um, on a very, very crowded island. We live in a very tiny little space. And even the farm where, where I was brought up is, uh, you know, we've got um, 1,700 acres of, of hill farm and coast farm in the Napdale Peninsula. And when I was a very small boy, that space seemed huge to me. But a couple of things that I have noticed, um, I left the farm to join the military in 1980. I went back again in 1995. And in actual fact, nothing had changed because my little tractor was still there. And it's amazing today, um, on the farm, that little tractor is still pulling rollers around. And it's amazing to me the way that things just seem to, to move, in some instances, so slowly. And I remember my grandfather telling me how he used to know when the, the wheat was ripe, ripe, sorry, because he could bend down and pick it up and smell it and squeeze it. And he would say, yep, that's perfect. If the sun's out this afternoon, we're going to start the harvest which is fantastic, but we now need to start moving things into um, what we need to do today in the modern farming environment. And there's a number of things that I've been asked to talk about, and some of those things are really what challenges are we seeing within industry today, and how can agriculture learn from those challenges? And I actually think sometimes we in industry can learn from some of the things that farmers are actually doing. And there was a, a, a story... Um, that was down in, uh, something's not moving right here. That was down um, where, um, actually where I live in Hampshire now. And there's this chap here who just happens to be a farmer just outside Salisbury. And one of the biggest problems that he has is being able to communicate. We all think today that communication is ubiquitous. You know, personal computers, smartphones, iPads, etc., ubiquitous. We all have those things. But in actual fact, in a large proportion of our countryside, farmers can't even communicate. So let's start to look at what the real nitty-gritty challenges are. We've got all this fantastic technology out there. We're looking to connect more and more and more things to the internet. Um, and yet, some people can't communicate. So this little chap here went out and he thought, well, I'm going to have to do something with this. Nobody in government Nobody with the telecommunications providers is going to help me. I'm going to have to do something for myself. So he basically went out and he built his little mast. He got some batteries. He got some solar power. He got a 4G receiver. He got a wooden mast. And then he introduced himself, and this is Richard Guy from Salisbury, and he's the farmer who built his own broadband. Because this was the only way that he could start to get some of the new technology that he was using to communicate with the internet. And this was only very small things. It's like using the RFID readers um, to read the tags on his cattle to get that information back. So it was just very small things that he could not do because of some absolute vital ingredients of um, the element of the internet of things, machine to machine, smart agriculture was missing. So I think we also need to bear in mind all the time when we're talking about technology, we need to talk about some of the core elements of that. And some of those things are actually, A, how are we acquiring the data from the sensors, whether it be a tractor or a single photon light camera? How are we getting that data? And where are we putting that data in order that those wonderful guys in Australia and, and Sydney University can start to do their analytics and machine learning, et cetera? So we need to think on some of the real common things. And these things are actually common across all industries. It's the biggest challenge that we actually have today. We have a challenge of multitude of machines, sensors, and endpoints. And if we consider, even today, how many endpoints you could possibly have on a farm, whether that be on a vehicle, whether it's a gate that you want to open and close at a specific time when a robot or you're driving your tractor through there. And then how are things connected? What are they communicating? What language are they talking? Now, on, on planet Earth at the moment, uh, I seem to remember from, from some uh, 
history lessons that I've done, there are approximately 740 active languages that us as human beings speak. And if we're very honest with ourselves and hold our hands up to those of us who only actually speak one language, and yet we're expecting everything that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to deal with multiple languages coming in. And whether we're connecting things over some of these things, so you might not recognize whether it's serial, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, CAN bus, Modbus, these are all just methods of a piece of machinery communicating to something else. We then look at how do we connect things. We've already seen um, our farmer who had to build his own broadband. And cell communications in the countryside might not actually be the most viable way to do things. So we have other things. We have things like mesh networks. So a mesh network is a localized Wi-Fi network that can be things like self-defining, self-healing. So it can actually build itself and understand where it is. But then again, what language are they talking? How is the data presenting itself? How do I make changes? If I want to add something new into the mix, we've already heard this morning about making things ubiquitous. Why do we have to have a red tractor with a red um, trailer on it? Why can't I have a red tractor with a pink trailer or a purple trailer? So we need to be able to do that. And we need to be able to make changes in order to future-proof what we are doing. One of the salient facts that I talk about, because I talk quite a lot about um, IoT, is in 2030... 80% of the machines that are in use are actually there already. They're there today. We're not going to change them. If we ask the conference center here, how often are you going to change the air conditioning unit on the roof? They will probably be once every 30 years. So we don't change things. Once we put things out, we want them to remain there. But we also want to make them smart. And part of this whole challenge within industry and within agriculture is how are we going to make the things that exist today smarter? Because I'm quite sure if the farmers again put a show of hands to say, how many of you would just go out and buy a new tractor because you wanted a smart one? The answer to that is probably no. Certainly if you're anything like my father or uncles, because they don't go and buy anything. So how do I do that? How do I secure and control things? And this is another key element to this, is about how do we actually take things and make sure that they're secure? I don't know if any of you read the fact that um, in the USA uh, a month or so ago, a group of hackers hacked into a Jeep Cherokee. And whilst this Jeep Cherokee was driving on the freeway, they could speed it up, slow it down, and make the brakes fail. And this is fact. They did it. They did it remotely. Luckily enough for the purpose of the experiment, the driver knew what was going to be happening. Otherwise, it could have been um, probably a fairly difficult situation. So we need to make sure that all of these challenges are addressed. But the key facts I've mentioned is it doesn't matter who you are, where you work, which industry you are in, all of these challenges are actually applicable. Because A, you don't want your tractor to go rogue any more than Google wants a driverless car to go rogue. So we want to be able to control things and make sure that we have things um, as, as secure as we can possibly make them. One of the things that I always use when we're talking about um, the Internet of Things is my little analogy of the Twitter paradigm. And the Twitter paradigm basically means that there are things out there publishing data, and there are things out there that are able to subscribe to data. And this is a model that has been created in order to decouple anything that's producing data from the things that are consuming data. So let's take some of the examples we've got up here. Um, if we go back to my, my farmer who built his own broadband, part of his challenge was his livestock movements. Where's my livestock? How are they behaving? What are they doing? So we take that in as a hashtag. In the same way as I may, if we weren't playing Germany last night, I've been looking at a hashtag for FC Scotland, just to see how we're getting on. Um, we didn't do too badly, by the way. Uh, still lost. So we're taking this data in, and because I subscribe to that data, I can consume that piece of data. But I've also got no idea where that data's coming from, and I don't need to know. So my system doesn't need to know the physical thing that's producing the piece of data or which language it's talking. I just need to make sure that I can understand what it's saying to me. In the same way as any industrial environment, 
kind of machines from many different sources, many different manufacturers. And I'm quite sure on your farms, you can be exactly the same. Whether the tractor is coming from New Holland, whether the harvester is coming from John Deere, etc. But in regards of how and what these machines are saying, we must be able to interpret that data. So again, coming back to a point that was made in the, the opening um, address, we've got to somehow take that data in and be able to normalize data in order that we can then utilize that information and pass it back to the other applications that are doing the machine learning, that are doing the analytics on it. So again, coming back to this thing about having information on how much moisture is in my soil, which system at the back end needs to look at that? And I actually done some research, having never worked in agricultural software before, the amount of packages available to farmers and the amount of modules available to farmers to do all these different things. And I'm quite sure that all, not all of them are interoperable. They don't work together. They're not um, a singular system. They probably work in silos of data. And part of the biggest challenge we have within IoT today is to stop the data silos, is to be able to bring information together. Because data only becomes valuable when that data can be utilized in the way that makes sense to the person who requires it. So this is how we look at this in terms of the Twitter paradigm and how we can connect different systems using different inputs and creating a singular view, a single source of truth, if you like, of what's happening in and around the farm. So why is this so difficult? You'd think that actually we've been developing software, and I've been involved in software development for nearly 20 years. I'm quite sure that we can actually make this simple today. But in actual fact, it's not. It can be very difficult around the fragmentation, the complexity, and then part, again, that was alluded to um, by our first speaker about that lock-in, about you buy a solution and you're fixed into that solution. You can't get out of it. And that can also be a challenge because we want to understand where else can we go. So part of the philosophy that, that I certainly have that we have within Eurotech, and it is a philosophy, the Internet of Things is not a technology. So whoever you listen to that says we get this new technology, it's not new. Eurotech de deployed their first IoT, true IoT solution in 1999 to control oil and gas pipelines in North America. And we did it because we said that a number of key elements. First and foremost, whichever communications methodology we use, it's got to be ubiquitous. And I'm not talking whether it's Wi-Fi or um, Ethernet backbone or satellite communications, but the, the way in which we do it has got to be ubiquitous. It's got to be able to be used and shared. We also decided that, yes, because of what we're doing, it also has to work over any type of network, whether that network as coming back to our farm at the beginning, suffers from poor um, bandwidth, from high latency. Latency being when it takes so long for the message to get from point A to point B. Because believe it or not, machines tend to not like that much, very much. So we then looked at all of that, and we come up with some certain elements about our ability to take whatever the hardware is that's producing the piece of data and separating that from the software that's sitting above that to enable that thing to communicate. And what we actually look at there is a number of these things, whether these may mean nothing to you, but let me explain that Java, for example, you've all got Java, either on your PCs, your laptops, your smartphones, or your tablets. It's a ubiquitous coding um, framework that we use in order to make this thing as open as we possibly can. We're part of an OSGI alliance. OSGI is basically just a way of putting applications into small containers. That means they're architecturally separate, but they can be put into anything. And we've actually taken all of the software that we use, we call it a the Everywhere Software Framework, but we've put that out into Kura, which is an open source foundation. Open source computing basically means that you can go and take this for free, another word that farmers seem to like a lot. So we can take this for free, and we can utilize this, and we can build systems with it. And people always say to me, but Ian, you, you, your organization, your CEO must be crazy. You build something, you put your IP into something, and then you give it away for free. Well, actually, 
That's what Bill Gates done when he started Microsoft. He built something, he gave it away for free. And today, I think it's approximately 92, 93% of desktop, laptop computers are using a Windows operating system that you paid for. So maybe he's not that crazy. So the whole thing here is about making things as open as possible, as available as possible. So common components, open source code, we use Java and OSGI to make this thing work. But then, this is where we actually end up with. So what does the architecture look like in terms of agriculture? So what we're then saying is this ability to be able to take to data from any source, whether it's a sensor, an actuator, a display inside a vehicle, um, as again, your weather station. But then also you can add into this data from elsewhere. So maybe your neighboring farm, farmer, um, as we had at the beginning, 15-year-old son is there and he's saying, tweeting away, it's raining on the farm again. And you can actually say, well, I'm in the farm next door, so it's obviously going to start raining soon. So you can start to take data in from any data source that you actually want and bring that information through. We then have this term over here of an IoT gateway. Well, a gateway is just somewhere that we aggregate data. We pull data together, we give it a common flavor, we call it MQTT. Um, for the boffins amongst you, that's message queue telemetry transport protocol. Um, and we bring all of that information together. And we then can send it through a pl integration platform in the cloud and then out to any of the field management applications you might find at the top end. So what we're trying to achieve here is this ability to take something that looks almost like um, an operating system to Internet of Things. Your laptops, you buy a mouse at the hardware store, you plug the mouse in, you just expect it to work. It becomes plug and play. You download an application from the internet onto your laptop, you expect it to work. We have exactly the same philosophy of this ability to be able to connect sensors and applications together and they just work. So I think that's kind of me. I think that's my last slide, if memory serves me correctly. Um, but we do have a little demonstration upstairs if you want to come and see it. And what we're actually looking at there is how can we control and understand what's happening to an agricultural vehicle as it moves around um, a, a, a farm with different um, topography, different fields, different crops, etc. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And um, on to the next speaker. Thank you very much.